continue our little trek through looking at some conversations that will help us have conversations. So here we are, number two. The words that Jesus said to the woman of Samaria. And we've been singing lots of things that are about living water. So first of all, the setting. Uh, what's the background? How do, how do we get to this particular point? We find that in verses 3, 4, 5, 6. Jesus left Judea, where he'd been talking with Nicodemus, and went once back... Uh, went, let me try that again. Went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Now, he, he probably was using Google Maps, if that was the case, who, because they send you the wrong way. Nobody, nobody went from Jerusalem to Galilee via Samaria. It was completely wrong. They all went via Perea, as you would know, of course. That you, you would have done exactly the same thing. But Jesus, we read, had to go through Samaria. Now, he'd done the trek dozens and dozens and dozens of times. He knew the route. He didn't need Google Maps. He didn't need his GPS. But nevertheless... He felt that, com- that he was compelled. He had to go there. Just those of you who last week, Deidre shared her Jesse story and felt she had to share and couldn't just sit that. That's the Holy Spirit working within you. And you feel like, I really need to do this. I, I'm not comfortable doing it, but I think God's prompting me. You get those sort of things sometimes. Well, God does that to you. You are cordially invited to share your story. So when you have a conversation, recognise it as God is in this. God's brought you here. God has brought this other person here. He's in charge. This is a divine appointment that you have. Now, the other person might not know that. We saw last week Nicodemus. He snuck to Jesus at night, not wanting anyone to see. Here the woman comes to the well, middle of the day, no one else around. Uh, Expect that the conversations that you are about to have may well happen when you least expect them to happen. Not planned by you, but they just pop up at the most unexpected times. And when they do... Be sensitive to the person. Be respectful. They, they weren't expecting a, a spiritual conversation. doesn't mean you back away from it, but just be respectful to them. But be, be clear. You've got something that's worth saying. You've got some really good news for them. They need to hear this. So be clear and tell your story. That's all. You don't have to give them a lot of theology. You're just telling them your story, your personal story. It's a... Tell them about you. Now, just by way of comparison, when Jesus came to Nicodemus, Nicodemus ended up not having too much to say. You know, the, the actual word count might vary from your version to my version, but nevertheless, Nicodemus said only 56 words. Jesus said over 200 words. Guess what happens when he talks to the woman? No, look, that's a life-threatening question. No, let me just do a word count for you till we can be safe. Jesus said about the same number of words in each conversation. But the woman was much more engaged in the conversation. When Jesus spoke with Nicodemus, there were three interactions, Nicodemus to Jesus, three times. When it came to the conversation with the woman, guess what's going to happen again? There were, there were six interactions in that conversation. At, at first, Jesus drove the conversation, but partway through, the woman started to become more engaged in that conversation. What it tells us is that every conversation is going to be different. When Jesus spoke with Nicodemus, he spoke about, you must be born again. Now, Never again did he use that sort of terminology with anyone else. This was the only time he said it. When he spoke to the woman, he told her about running water, living water, flowing water. 
And that was an illustration that he used again and again and again. Uh, that really connected. And she connected with that. She, she got that. So let's have a look at how the conversation unfolds. The first interaction they have is in verses 7, 8 and 9. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her... So here's the conversation beginning. Now, if you're taking notes, note that we need to maintain decorum in all our conversations. It began with the, the person who was socially superior uh, leading the conversation. Now, for Nicodemus, he's the one who initiated the conversation because he was socially superior. Uh, he was a big wig. He was a political and academic high flyer. No one could speak to him unless he spoke first. Now, Jesus is sticking to the social conventions of the time. He, he's radical in what he says, but he's still operating within the social framework. So he initiates the conversation with the woman uh, and with her. He's open, public space, very visible. Uh, there's no behind closed door stuff and it's male and female maintaining decorum and they're very polite she always refers to him as sir and he talks to her and says ma'am and so they're very courteous to one another and that's how we need to be as well um, socially aware and, and polite in response to Jesus opening comment she immediately says, not interested. Says, I'm a Samaritan, end of story. Now, you remember we polled our studio audience and came up with the top five ways to kill a spiritual conversation? And they look like this. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, which was the popular one that Nicodemus kept going to. Yeah, he really didn't get it. Uh, but th the others... Um, for the woman of Samaria, she opts for the bottom one. She says, I'm a Samaritan. And it doesn't matter what you want to use as the final word there. I'm a Samaritan, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Calathumpian. It, it just is shut down. No, we're, we're worlds apart. What does Jesus do when he bumps into these brick walls? He just talks on as if they had not put up the brick wall at all. They could have said, thank you very much, that's really interesting, I want to know more. Or they could have said, that doesn't make sense. Or they could have said, I'm a Samaritan. He's, con he's going to have the conversation. And the little nuances of conversation, we're not going to slow him down. So, how does he demolish the wall? Well, the second interchange uh, in verses 10, 11 and 12 is where he opens up and says, well, I've got something that you need. And when you have a conversation, you're in exactly the same boat. You have got something the other person needs. You've got eternal life. You've got abundant life. You've got a hotline to heaven. You've got a friendship with Jesus. These are things that everyone out there really needs. And so Jesus opens up this next interchange with the words if you knew sort of sparks a little bit of interest and I guess the modern equivalent is, is saying did you know here's something that I find really interesting you might be interested in this as well and yeah so in the conversation Jesus says if you knew if you knew the gift of God if you knew who it is that you know, can give you this gift, if you knew this sort of stuff, you would jump into this and you would ask for this. Now, for us, it's like saying, did you know? Did you know that God wants to give you a gift? Did you know what I relearned this week? So I went to church on Sunday. It was great. You'll never guess what I relearned when I was there. Did you know that you can actually talk to God? Say it. Wow, this is really interesting. This is amazing. I didn't know that. 
or I, I relearned that for the first time. You can do that. And the woman said, what did she say? Brick wall. You've got nothing. You've got nothing that can help me. You've got nothing that I'm interested in. It's just the brick wall. And here she is back at I'm a Samaritan. Now she's adding the Nicodemus element. That doesn't make any sense to me. You, you've got nothing that I can understand, nothing that I can tap into. Um, she's probably adding, well, that's just your interpretation. Yeah. It, it's really a shutdown. You've, you haven't got a bucket. doesn't matter what they say. It's a second, no, I don't want to have this conversation. How do you think Jesus is going to handle a second brick wall? Go on, have a guess. Go on. <laughs> she could have easily said, that's really fascinating, I want to know more. And it would have got exactly the same answer from Jesus. He doesn't take no for an answer. And if you learn anything out of listening to Jesus having conversations, that's probably the thing to hear. When they say no, they don't actually mean no because the conversation continues. Jesus goes on and has more conversations and they still keep engaging. So don't take no for an answer. Takes us into the third interchange that they have in verses 13, 14, 15. And Jesus is saying, it's better than you could ever possibly imagine. He's got something really good, not just good news, but really good news that he wants to share. This is the conversation you can have. So Jesus answered, beginning the next interaction. And look at the end of um, verse 14. It will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And here he is, this is what we've been singing. It's rivers of living water, this spring of living water. Most people, all, forget most people, all people, everyone out there has got a problem. We're spiritually parched and dry. We need the water that Jesus can give. And what he promises is not just water oozing out of the ground, but something like tapping into the great artesian basin. And you get this spring of water bubbling up out of the ground. That's the sort of image that Jesus wants this woman to get her head around. And us. That this is Jesus at work. Fresh water just keeps coming and coming more than you could possibly imagine or use. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water out of the well with a bucket will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give, they will never thirst. Because Jesus always more than satisfies. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, with, within you. You've got this. You've got this spring. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. God is constantly pouring into you more than you could possibly ever use. That's the good news. Well, that's good news. Uh, when we go just a little further on from John 4 to John chapter 7, we find Jesus again using this same illustration. Jesus stood, he's in the middle of the temple, and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty... What do they do about that? Come to me. Jesus is the solution. Not turn up to church, not pray more, not give more, not do more good deeds, but come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. It's Jesus wants you to have this. He wants you to receive it. He wants to give it to you. Let's move on, because the news is not all good. When you find what happens life after death, the rich man died, closed his eyes in death, opened his eyes to discover to his horror he was in Hades. The dead man cried out from Hades, Father Abraham, have pity on me. 
and send Lazarus to do what? To dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. There is unending, unquenchable thirst in hell. It's a lake of fire. It's not a good place to be. And so Jesus is offering something to satisfy thirst. If we don't accept that, things only get far worse. This went up on our Facebook page and you can copy and paste that onto your own Facebook page if you wish. The question is not, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? That's the way the world usually frames it. Why would a loving God send me to hell? I'm such a nice person. Wrong question. Yes, you're a nice person, but it's the wrong question. The real question is, why would anyone choose hell instead of choosing a loving God? And unless we choose him, we will automatically choose hell, which is why we need to tell people, you've got to choose Jesus. And then when Jesus went to the cross, He is the only person who's ever experienced hell on earth. And in those three hours of darkness that shut down everyone else's view, he experienced what we could never even possibly imagine. And he cried out, I thirst. Exactly what you'd expect from living hell. No satisfaction, no fulfilment, no peace thirst, unending thirst. But look at the contrast. When we get to heaven, we read never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Everything that we could ever possibly need, our satisfaction is fulfilled beyond expectation when we get to heaven. And that's why the final invitation that's given at the Bible almost as the book is drawing to a close, the last chapter. The spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who wishes take the free gift of, surprise, surprise, the water of life. This is what heaven is about. It's the fulfilment that Jesus gives. Heaven is going to be so fabulously fulfilling and refreshing and delightful in every possible way. No wonder we are to give the invitation. Come, the Spirit and the Bride, that's us, the Bride of Christ, say come, come and enjoy what only Jesus can do. That's the conversation that Jesus is having about living water and it's a conversation that we can have as well so coming full circle back to our text whoever drinks the, the water that I give will never thirst indeed the water that I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life this is what we have to offer And we should be enjoying it in the meantime. Moving on, the fourth interchange then from verses uh, 16, 17, 18. Jesus does an interesting thing and he changes tack altogether. It's not about living water. Really he says, how are your personal relationships? Now she didn't see that coming. That, That was a really a blindside one. But what a great thing to ask. Jesus said, go and call your husband and come back. Now, husband-wife relationships are really important to Jesus. And how much better life is when husband and wife are on the same page spiritually. And so that's why we we feel, especially for, for people like Elsie, and we pray for Bert, that he can be on the same page spiritually. Now, uh, look away at this point. The the woman was suffering, not physical wounds, but you know, maybe physical wounds to go through five blokes and 
and now be with someone else in a de facto relationship, she was suffering some really bad wounds. She'd been hurt, hurt and re-hurt and was probably hurting others in the process as well. This was a really messy situation. But it was just a springboard um, because Jesus wants more than just good husband-wife relationships, good home relationships. He then goes on and in the next interchange, verses 19 through to 24, that's just a, a step towards the most important relationship of all. How's your relationship with God? The two are often connected. And so what we need is to work on this one as a priority, your relationship with God. So the woman said, and notice here, she jumps in first. It's not her turn to talk. But this has now begun to get personal. And so she leads off the conversation and says, so I can see you're a prophet. But notice what she's doing at this point. She's putting up a I'm a Samaritan brick wall again. Uh, where do we worship? Let, let's not talk about me and my relationships and my husband's and my sex life. Let's talk about what's a good place to worship. Um, should we go to Jerusalem? Should we go to Mount Ephraim? We, let's not talk about me. Guess what Jesus is going to do? Go on. You can see this coming a mile off because you know how he responds to brick walls. He wants to have the conversation. Boom. That's what he does. Jesus comes in in verse 21. Ma'am, Jesus replies, believe me, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He's saying, I'm not going to get sidetracked into where we're doing what, um, what's the best place, because that's not the key issue. Now, he didn't come straight out and say, you've got a really crappy religion, but he did say, it's not good enough. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. You haven't got the whole story. You haven't got the full picture. There is more that God wants you to know. What you've got is okay so far, but you haven't gone far enough. And so he can then add, as a helpful comment, not just, well, your religion sucks, but he goes on to add, in order to help you get the distance you need to go, we worship what we do know for salvation is of the Jews. Now, what's the key topic in his uh, answer to her? It's not about where, it's about the end result. It's about getting her to salvation. And so Jesus goes on, true worshippers. It's not about where, don't get sidetracked into the, the brick walls. True worshippers worship in spirit and in truth and then he reinforces that before she gets a chance to put up another brick wall. And then when we come down to verses 25, 26 to the last interchange that they have he's about giving the answer. The woman said, I know that the Messiah Messiah is the Hebrew language Old Testament word Christ is the New Testament language word. Uh, I know that this person is coming. When he comes, explain everything. And Jesus came straight out and said, is there ever any doubt as to who Jesus is? He spelled it out. You don't get any clearer than this. Jesus says, I'm that person. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. I'm the one that you ought to be looking for. Which is why he can say, I will give you li rivers of living water. And then... <coughs> Leaving the water jar, she went uh, back into town and, say, and said, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Question, I wonder if this is the Christ. Now, Jesus has just spelled it out in about as clear possible terms as he possibly could, saying, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. 
And she runs off saying, oh, I wonder if this is the right... Jesus obviously didn't go to the Billy Graham School of Evangelism because he let her run away without signing up to who he was. She went off with a question. Don't be disappointed if the conversation ends and you haven't got to where you wish it would go. Remember Nicodemus? It took him three years to come round, three years plus a crisis, before he got to the point of working out what he needed to do with Jesus. So don't be disappointed if you give it your best shot and like the woman of Samaria, she runs off and says, oh, I wonder if what you're saying is really right. There will be other spin-offs that you haven't counted on. So what happens? Many of the Samaritans in that town did what? Many of them ended up believing Uh, many more on top of that became believing as Jesus stayed there a couple of days so if you miss first base with this person you've sown seeds and that person will go on and say I met this really crazy person today you would not believe that they would not take no for an answer Every time I said, I'm a Samaritan, they just kept on telling me I need Jesus and he's living water. And she ended up sowing more seeds than Jesus possibly could have because she spoke to all her ex-husbands by the looks of it. (laughs) And many of them became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said Now we've heard for ourselves. So they bore fruit from her seeds. And we know that this man really is the Messiah, the Christ, the Saviour, the Lord, the living water, the Master. He is the one that we've come to seek. And that is what makes this conversation something pretty special. And you can do that. Don't be discouraged. But keep on taking no as an invitation to take the next step to follow a Jesus model about where you want to go. So let me pray for us. Father, you've promised us that the fields are ripe for harvest and we will bump into people who want to have the conversation. We also know from experience that there are plenty of people who do not want to have the conversation but who need to have the conversation. And so with the divine appointments that you put into our coming week, Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to be able to see them as your appointment for us to be able to say and to do some word of wisdom into their lives, to be able to not take no for an answer, but to go on to the next step, to say that your, your relationships need some work and your relationship with God needs some work. Did you know what I've learned this week? Would you like to know who Jesus is? Do you know what Jesus can do for you? You know what he did for me? Lord, help us to have that conversation so that we might be your blessing into the lives of others and then take those seeds that we sow and help them to be planted into the lives of yet others again. Multiply your kingdom, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.